Well, Shirts UMC, you probably know that most pastors have some things that they tend to repeat. Is that true? Have you all had that in your experience? Well, today we've got one of those for me, um, so I guess I'll apologize, but it's usually because there's something that we repeat that we find really insightful or really helpful for ourselves or for our congregations. And so anyway, we've got one of those today. So you might have heard this from me before. If you haven't, you're going to hear it from me probably several times in the coming months and years. Um, but it's, it's good news from Jesus Christ. Um, one of those for me is that the places in Scripture where it says the word peace in most of our translations um, can also, we can also use the word shalom, as you've already heard today. And one of the reasons why I like to do this is because it can help us to broaden our read of the word peace to mean something a little broader, like total well-being or maybe profound wellness, which for me at least, I think gets more at the heart of what scripture is going for when it talks about peace than sometimes we might think of as you know, an absence of conflict or a, non, a time of non-war. Um, some have called shalom happiness, but they want to make sure it's emphasized that it's not a fleeting happiness, it's a sustaining joy. So then, given all that, given this notion of peace as shalom, as total well-being or profound wellness, let's read verse 7 again together. So it says, and shalom, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How does that sound, friends? Does that sound like a good, good thing that we want to have? Do you want to have total well-being beyond even our understanding guarding your hearts and your minds? I think so, right? I think we all would say affirmative to that one. Well, pa Paul promises us that shalom is exactly what God wants for us too. That promise comes at the end of Paul's letter here, which has been calling for the, re which, which he calls the result of living our lives as Jesus has shown us. The commands earlier in the chapter are not meant to be exhaustive. Instead, they're the highlights um, that we have learned to follow our Lord who has humbled himself, showing us the way of God's love. Now, there's a couple things about those examples that I want to note. Paul, writing from prison, remember, teaches us to rejoice always. To believe in the gospel means that in every possible set of circumstances that we can face, we still have reason to rejoice. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, I just think about that, right? To be in prison and rejoicing and inviting others to rejoice. And I just, I'm humbled by that. And I think about how wonderful that is, that anything that is going on in our lives, we have reason to rejoice and we put it in context of the good news of Jesus Christ, of all that God has done for us and of all that God promises us. And then in verse 5, we are instructed to let our gentleness be made known to everyone. In our context, I think maybe for some of us, it just depends on how you use the word gentleness in your life, but for some of us, gentleness might be better translated something like generosity or care for others. The, the point here is that as long as we see gentleness as an active verb, something calling us to care about how we treat one another, then I think it's appropriately translated. Just like when Reverend Thomas last week preached about the greatest commandment, Paul reminds us that the Christian life is defined by how we care for others. It's that same move that Jesus shows us as a turn from seeking our own future power and glory to attending to the presence of God who is with us and with our neighbor now. And then we have verse six, which is often one of people's favorite verses in all of scripture. In it, we are redirected from lives of worry to lives of prayer, right? Pretty good exchange, I think. Um, and let's not miss that when we pray, we are invited to pray with thanksgiving. I'm emphasizing that intentionally. Whenever we come to God, we are thankful, right? In God's presence, we have perspective of all that God has done for us and of all that God has promised. A couple weeks ago, we were kind of talking about this in Thursday morning Bible study, and the class noted how that in our society, as a lot of us and a lot of people have gotten out of the habit of rituals of practicing prayer, of whether it's some people had rituals of praying in the morning or praying before meals or praying at bedtime. But as that has become less and less common, we as, as a people have become a less grateful people. 
Oh, how our lives and the lives of those around us are changed when we're constantly showing up as thankful people, right? It's just a different energy in the room. It's a different experience to be with somebody else when they're, when they're somebody who's bringing a thankful spirit as opposed to one that's filled with, filled with worry or frustration. Now, as we live like Jesus, we experience the results in verse 7, right? The shalom that is promised to us. We become people who share the attitude, the perspective, and the spiritual practices of Jesus, such that his very heart and his very mind become ours. This is part of that shalom promise, that we become people who think like Jesus. We become people who feel and have hearts like Jesus, like our Lord. The Christian faith is not some abstract system of beliefs which offers us little bearing on our daily experience, right? Some might talk about it that way, but that's not true. God wants our lives to be radically changed, improved, and even saved as our closeness with Christ guides our thinking, our praying, and our living. Now, I don't know if if you would have noticed this on first read, but Paul uses for us in a short passage in these nine verses the phrase, in the Lord, three times. And I, I think it's a really important one for us to think about, in the Lord. Do you, do you talk about, do you think about living your life in the Lord? It's a, it's a beautiful phrase that's throughout the New Testament. We are invited to be so connected to the Christ that everything we are and everything we do falls within what Christ, who Christ is and what Christ is doing. All right, so I was trying to think of images for this. This is not my strength, I'm not going to lie. But uh, for me, I thought about those things that I was calling human-sized bubbles, which Ash taught me. There's a word for them. They're called zorbs. And Ash has helped me and got this great image on the screen. Have you all seen these? Sometimes they can be, you know, you can be playing with them. Maybe children go in them or even adults I've seen as well. Um, But this image came to mind as if we think about that the zorb or this big bubble being Christ, and how everything that we are in our whole lives can be lived in connection to the Christ, in, with inside him. That we're, we're being, our hearts and our minds are being guided and protected and guarded by the Christ. That's an intimate relationship, right? That our whole life would fall within who Christ is and what Christ is doing. But this is the invitation of the gospel for us today. Now, I have to tell you, I saw an image going around on social media this week. I don't know if some of you all saw this, but it was asking this question of, would one rather have a trillion dollars on the one hand, pretty good number, uh, or 10 minutes with Jesus? Uh, It was interesting, and I was like, oh, I wonder what's going on with this. So it made me think about it for myself, and I thought about it also for our congregation here at Church United Methodist Church. And I thought, I wonder how we would answer that. And I think there's a lot of great answers, and so I don't want to give the impression that I think there's one perfect answer. And I got to say, I understand the notion that seeing Jesus in person, in flesh, would be a very powerful experience. I mean, I'd I'd love for for that to happen uh, to me and and for all of us. But I have to tell you, I'm really left hoping that if we were to talk about that and stop the service right now and just have conversations I'm hoping that what some of us in this room would maybe say is that, well, hey, this is kind of a false dichotomy because we're with Jesus all the time, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you hope that some of us would maybe think like that and feel like that, that, hey, I don't really have to choose in a way because Jesus is with me all the time. And so, yeah, seeing him in flesh would be, would be great, but I, I do see him. I do feel him. I do know him all the time. And I believe that's what Paul is inviting for us to experience and to know as we live our lives in Christ. I'm hoping that we just say that we know the presence of Christ as we think, as we pray, and as we live. And as our lives become more and more firmly situated within the living Christ, friends, we will experience this great promise. We will experience shalom, total well-being, that God intends for us all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.